Y'all was laughing and saying hello out there in TV land. This, I'm going to read to you a little section today, maybe two if we have time, from a novel called Rainy, a Novel. Uh, it's written by Charles Edgerton, excuse me, Clyde Edgerton. And Clyde Edgerton is actually a North Carolina writer. He was born in Durham, as a matter of fact. He's um, now retired from teaching fiction at the University of North Carolina, Wilmington, written about a half a dozen books. Rainy is his first novel from 1985. Uh, he followed that up. You may have heard uh, Walking Across Egypt, Float Plane Notebooks, Killer Diller, Lunch at the Piccadilly Cafe. So he's written, you know, he's, he, he's a very well-known writer regionally. He's known nationally, but he's not as famous nationally as he is regionally, I think. But um, <clears throat> anyway, this is his first novel. This is a novel about culture clashes. And I will say just kind of, it may seem like a light and funny novel, and in fact it is, but it offended some people. He was at the time teaching at Campbell's College in Bowie's Creek, which is a, uh, a religious affiliated college, and he was asked to leave. So <laughs> you can't make fun of Southern culture in some places. All right, so the, the, the novel starts out with a, a wedding announcement, and, and then, then we'll move on into the novel. Lister, North Carolina, April 18th, 1975. Lister is an imaginary town. From the Hanson County Pilot. Mr. and Mrs. Thurman A. Bell announced the engagement of their daughter, Rainey, to Charles C. Shepard of Atlanta, Georgia. Mr. Bell owns the Hope Road General Store, and the family attends Bethel Free Will Baptist Church. Rainey graduated from Chester Knowles High School, where she was in the school band and various other activities. She attended Lister Community College. Charles Shepard is the son of Dr. and Mrs. William Shepard of Atlanta. He is the assistant librarian at Lister Community College. Dr. Shepard is a college professor, while Mrs. Shepard is a public school teacher. A June 7th wedding is planned at Bethel Free Will Baptist Church. A reception will follow in the education building. The couple plans to honeymoon at Myrtle Beach and live in Lister at 209 Catawba Drive. We get married in two days, Charles and me. Charles's parents are staying at the Ramada, wouldn't stay with any of us. And today, me, Mama, Aunt Naomi, and Aunt Flossie ate lunch with Charles's mother, Mrs. Shepard and found out that she's, of all things, a vegetarian. We ate at the K&W. Mrs. Shepard wanted to eat at some place we could sit down and order, like a restaurant, but Aunt Naomi strongly suggested the K&W. She said the K&W would be more reasonable and the line wouldn't be long on a Thursday, so we ate at the K&W. I got meatloaf. Mama got meatloaf. They have unusually good meatloaf, not bready at all. Aunt Naomi got turkey, Aunt Flossie got roast beef, and Mrs. Shepard, Mrs. Shepard didn't get any meat at all. She got the vegetable plate. When we got seated, Mama says, I order the vegetable plate every once in a while myself. Oh, did you get the vegetable plate, says Aunt Naomi to Miss Shepard. Sure did, said Miss Shepard. I stopped eating meat. We all looked at her. I got involved in a group in Atlanta which was putting together programs on simple living, and after a few programs, I became convinced that being a vegetarian, me that is, made sense. Somehow, I thought people were born as vegetarians. I never thought about someone just changing over. What kind of group was that, asked Mama. Several Episcopal women. I'm originally Methodist, but... Naomi, says this woman, walking by, holding a tray. Good gracious, is this all your family? <clears throat> Her husband went ahead and sat down about three tables over, picked a chair with arms. It sure is, says Aunt Naomi. Let me introduce you. Opal Register, this is my sister-in-law, Doris Bell. That's Mama. You know Doris, don't you? Oh, yes, I think we met in here one time, right over there. And this is her daughter, Rainey, who's getting married Saturday. Mercy me, says Miss Register. She had on big glasses with a chain, little brown curls on the top of her head, and too much lipstick. You're at the start of a wonderful journey, honey, she says. It was 37 years for me and Carl, the 21st of last month. I hope your journey is as happy and fulfilling as ours. And this is Miss Millie Shepard, the groom's, grooms-to-be's mother. She's up from Atlanta, Georgia. Atlanta, says Miss Register. 
and this is Flossie Purvis, Doris's sister. And y'all, this is Opal and Carl Register, said Aunt Naomi, pointing towards Mr. Register, who had started eating over at his table. He smiled with food in his mouth. You couldn't see any, though. Atlanta, said Mrs. Register again. You don't know C.C. Lawrence, do you? No, I don't think I do, said Mrs. Shepard. C.C. works at one of those big banks in Atlanta. He got a law degree and a business degree, one right after the other. His mama and daddy didn't think he'd ever finish, and then working at, and them working at Liggett and Myers. He went, Opal, Miss Register called out, come and sit down and eat. Well, nice to have met you, said Mrs. Register. Good luck on that wonderful journey, honey, she says to me. When Mrs. Register was out of hearing distance, Mama says, Mr. Register just had a prostrate operation, and I don't think he's recovered. Prostate, says Aunt Flossie. Is it? Prostate? Oh, you know, I've always liked him better than her. She always makes so much out of every little thing. The conversation went from the registers to prostrate operations back around to eating meat. You know, says Aunt Naomi, once in a while I've gone without meat, but I got so weak I thought I'd pass out. Well, that happens a bit at first, Mrs. Shepard says, but after a few days, that usually goes away. It's a matter of what you get used to, I think. The body adjusts. I'd be afraid I couldn't get enough protein, says Mama. Oh, no, says Mrs. Shepard. There are many protein substitutes for meat. Beans, soybeans, for example, are excellent. My next-door neighbor, Lily Cox, brought me some hamburger with soybean in it, says Aunt Naomi, when I had the flu last winter, and it tasted like cardboard. She's always trying out the latest thing. I couldn't do without my meat, says Mama. She was fishing through her tossed salad for cucumber and putting it on her plate. I'd be absolutely lost without sausage for breakfast. Cold sausage, the mild, not the hot. Do they have cold sausage in Atlanta? I don't think so. I don't really know. Do you get the patties or the links? Aunt Naomi asked Mama. The patties. Thurman don't like the links. They roll off his plate. We all laughed. Even Mrs. Shepard. So Mama stretched it out. Every time we go to Kiwanis for the pancake supper, he'll lose one or two links because of the way he eats his pancakes, pushes them all around in the syrup. Last time, one rolled up under the edge of Sam Lockamy's plate, and for a minute there, we couldn't find it. Then Sam swore it was his. I guess you have less cholesterol if you don't eat meat, says Aunt Naomi. There are health advantages, said Mrs. Shepard, and also our women's group has been concentrating on how eating less meat can help curtail hunger in the third world. On another planet, says Aunt Naomi. Oh, no, no, developing nations, says Miss Shepard. She finished chewing and swallowed. Developing nations. What I don't understand, says Aunt Naomi, is that if they don't eat their own cows, like in India, then why should we send them ours? They wouldn't eat ours, would they? Or maybe they would eat American cows. We wouldn't send meat to India, of course. We'd send grain and other staple goods. The fewer cows we eat, the less grain we'll need to feed cows, so there'll be a greater grain surplus. Aunt Naomi blew her nose on this Kleenex she had been fumbling with. She had a cold. She can get more nose blows on one Kleenex than anybody I ever saw. She always ends up with this little tiny corner which she slowly spreads out, then blows her nose into. We'd finished eating, so I said, Aunt Naomi, you get more nose blows out of one Kleenex than anybody I've ever seen in my life. I probably won't be able to sing on Sunday, she said. She sings in the church choir. This cold just drags on and on and on. Ain't it nice the way Rainey and Charles play music together, says Mama to Mrs. Shepard. I was relieved to get off the meat subject. Yes, it is, says Miss Shepard. I think they're wonderful, says Aunt Naomi. They sound real good together, says Aunt Flossie. Music is what brought me and Charles together. He plays banjo and collects old songs from the mountains. When I sang for the faculty at the college Christmas dinner, he was there. He's the assistant librarian. And he came up afterward and complimented my singing. He was real nice about it, and he has been ever since. Charles is the kind of person who is real natural about people, and he is as smart as he can be. Then I met him again when I went to the library to check out a record. They have a good collection, thanks to Charles. One thing led to another, and the first thing you know, we're playing music together. We had three or four performances together, the Kiwanis Club and such. Charles calls them gigs. Charles sent me a tape, says Mrs. Shepard. You two really do sound good together. You have a beautiful voice, Rainey. I thanked her. 
Charles is learning to sing, too. We can harmonize on two or three songs. He's improving gradually. He plays good banjo. He don't look like a banjo picker, but he sounds good. I don't know what I'm going to do without Rainey singing around the house and helping out with Norris and Mary Faye, says Mama, looking at me. Mama, I'm 24 years old, I said. There's a big gap between me and my little brother Norris and sister Mary Faye. Norris is eight and Mary Faye is 11. Mary Faye picks on Norris all the time, but sometimes he deserves it. How many children do you have, Mrs. Shepherd? says Aunt Flossie. One, says Aunt Naomi. Please call me Millie, says Mrs. Shepherd. All of you, she says, and smiles. You too, Rainy, if you're comfortable with that. I have only one, she said. Charles is the only one. <clears throat> you would think a man could get married without getting drunk, especially after I explained that nobody in my family drunk alcohol, except Uncle Nate, who was in the Navy in World War II, got burned in combat over 50% of his body and caught pneumonia and had to be discharged from the Pacific. He had to stay in the hospital for three and a half months and now he has asthma spells. Uncle Nate comes to our house in a taxi at any hour of the day or night, drunk, cussing his former wife who's dead, Aunt Joanne. And when I say drunk, I mean so drunk he can't get up the front steps without me and Mama and sometimes the taxi driver helping him. And smell? Uncle Nate, I'm talking about, whew, a sweat whiskey smell that lingers in the house as solid as flower smells at a funeral. Lingers long after Mama's undressed him, got him in the tub, and piled his clothes on the back porch. But the thing is, he don't ever get asthma when he's drunk. Mary Faye and Norris have to stand there in the middle of all that, being influenced in no telling what ways. When Uncle Nate's sober, he's my favorite uncle. I love his stories about when he was growing up with Mama and Aunt Flossie and Uncle Norris, who lives in Charlotte, and their Uncle Pug. And he always gives me presents and says I'm his favorite niece. He's always lived with us and worked at Daddy's store part-time. His lung troubles make him so disabled he gets a check every month from the government. They think he inhaled so much smoke he'll never recover. The scars are mostly on his body under his clothes, so you can't ever see them except on his left wrist and under his left ear. He never talks about it except to Uncle Newton, who was in the war too. Sometimes his asthma gets so bad he has to sit perfectly still for three or four hours. So he can't get a job anywhere, of course, except helping Daddy out at the store. Daddy says he makes a big difference and is very dependable, unless he's drunk. I don't know what Mama will do about getting him out of the taxi and up the steps, since I'll be living here in Lister. Mary Faye and Norris will have to help, but Mama hates for them to be exposed to such. Charles knew all about Uncle Nate and how I, how my whole family, feels about drinking. So at the rehearsal Friday night, everything was going fine, except Mama caught Norris hiding in the baptism place and made him sit on the front row. She'd already caught him once. I told him the water would flow in there and drown him if he didn't watch out. Mary Faye was being one of my attendants and as smart as she could be. I'm standing in the back of the church with Daddy and Flora, my cousin, who directed the wedding, and I notice that Charles' friend, Buddy Sinclair from Maryland, who I had never met until that night, keeps going outside, and Charles keeps following him out. Phil, Jim, Dale, and Crafton, my cousins, were of course staying in their places like they were supposed to. Flora gives me a little push and I start down the aisle with Daddy. Charles is standing there with his red-faced grin. When Preacher Gordon says, you may kiss the bride, I turn left to Charles, and there were these little red blood vessels in his left eye that looked like red thread, and all of a sudden, I caught a whiff of you-know-what. It hit me. It all suddenly fell together. I thought they had been going outside to talk. The thing you won't believe is, Charles's daddy looked lit, too. I did not kiss Charles. I kept my lips clamped. I grabbed him by the arm and led him right outside, up the aisle, and out the front door. Medora Bryant, my maid of honor, and some of the other girls were clapping as hard as they could. They couldn't tell what was really happening. 
When I got him out on the front porch, right beside the bell rope, I said, now I was really tore up. I said, Charles, I have told you for months about the condition Uncle Nate has put our family in with alcohol, and you promised me you would not have a bachelor party and get drunk, and here you are, drunk, under the nose of Preacher Gordon, Mama, Daddy, Flora, and Aunt Naomi, and Aunt Flossie, and my bridesmaid, and Mary Faye, and Norris, and I will never forget this as long as I live. Rainey, he says, first of all, I am not having a bachelor party, and second of all, I am not drunk. I am not doing anybody any harm. I, not doing any harm, Charles, I, Rainey, Buddy drove all the way down here from Baltimore, Maryland, and he has one little pint of something in his car, and we were in the war together, and if you will just relax, and he's the only one of my close friends in the wedding. All these damn cousins are yours. Charles, please do not start cussing right here on church property. And if you were mad about my cousins being in the wedding, I would have appreciated you saying something about that before now, like while I was spending all my time getting this whole thing planned. Charles's daddy, Dr. Shepard, walks up. I could not believe what was happening, yet I dared not make a scene in front of him. I was thinking that if Mama and Aunt Naomi and Aunt Flossie found out about all this drinking, I would die. Rainy honey, Dr. Shepard says, you look adorable. He's a big man and wears those glasses without any rims, shaped like stop signs. He's a math professor of all things, a doctor. And Mrs. Shepard is a school teacher. They use these long words I know Mama and Daddy don't know. And they should know Mama and Daddy don't know them. But they'll go on back down to Atlanta after the wedding and we won't see them except maybe a few times a year. Charles says that they belong to a country club and all that. What gets me is that Charles said he explained to them about us being Christians and not drinking, which I didn't know even though we had to explain, until Medora told me that Charles's parents would probably be used to drinking spiked punch at weddings, and what were we going to do? I hadn't thought about it. I've never been to a wedding where they drink liquor in the punch. I mean, there's usually a preacher at a wedding, and it's usually in a church, but Medora explained how rich people, or at least Episcopalians and Catholics and sometimes Methodists, will get married in church and then ride over to a country club or someplace where they all drink up a storm. Dr. Shepard stands there kind of flushed and glassy-eyed and tells me how proud he is, and he laughs at everything he says, funny or not. And I'll be darned if he didn't reach up right then and there and pull the church bell rope and ring the bell. I could just see old Mrs. Bledsoe down the road, figure it was not Friday night at all, but Wednesday night, prayer meeting night, and get all upset and maybe grab Mr. Bledsoe, who can't hear, and cart him off to a prayer meeting which don't exist, not to mention all the other people in hearing distance. The rehearsal dinner was in the education building around behind the church. I walked down the church steps between Charles and his daddy, their arms locked through mine, not able to say a word and hot behind the ears with embarrassment at the prospect of a scandal. When we got to the education building, there was Mrs. Shepard, Millie, standing at the door smiling. Smooth as could be, she said, and kissed Dr. Shepard on the lips, right there in the door to the education building. Inside, there were two long tables and a head table. Aunt Naomi was in charge. She had got Betty Winterberry to cater, steaks, T-bone steaks, french fries, the works. I had hoped all along it wouldn't be tacky, like paper tablecloths, which Aunt Naomi was talking about at first. I'm certainly not going to be cow-tied to any fancy ways of the shepherds, but I did want things to be proper for everyone concerned. On the tables were about 12 or 13 red checkered overlapped tablecloths that Aunt Flossie had borrowed from Penny's Grill and had to wash and dry later that night in order to get them back to the grill in time for Penny to serve breakfast, and they opened at 6 a.m. And over in the corner, Mac Lumley was sitting on a bale of hay playing his guitar. He didn't charge but $10 and furnished the hay, hay bale too. Somebody suggested me and Charles sing, but I think singing at your own wedding wouldn't be right. Aunt Flossie had put together the prettiest flower arrangement right in the middle of the head table, roses, daisies, and Queen Anne's lace, and pittosporum and mendandina for greenery. Just before supper, Charles and Buddy went out for you-know-what, I guess. I had to keep smiling and be as nice as I could to everybody. The supper was meaningful, but while I was cutting a piece of T-bone steak, I bent over to Charles and whispered, Charles, I will never forget this. 
But Charles just turned to Daddy and started talking about the Braves. They always talk about the Braves. As soon as they see each other, they start talking about the Braves. I wanted to say, Daddy, don't you see what Charles is doing? How can you sit there and talk about the Braves while Charles is doing what he's doing? But I didn't say anything. Lord knows there was disturbance enough. I had spent all that time working out the arrangements, and Charles wrote all the invitations by hand. He has this beautiful handwriting, and we had talked about all his new library job and our house and our future and how everything was going to work out, and he had been so good about running little errands. And now this. Charles is very intelligent and good-looking in his own way. His head is slightly large, but I think it just seems that way because his shoulders are narrow. And oh, we had one or two little fusses over getting ready for the wedding, but no, nothing more than you'd shake a stick at. And we've been playing music at different gatherings right along through all this, getting better and better and having lots of fun. Charles learns real fast, and we like the same music mostly. Then I end up sitting at my own wedding rehearsal dinner, fussing at Charles for doing the one thing I was hoping against hope wouldn't ever happen since Medora explained about how some people get drunk at weddings. We had talked about drinking several times, and I had this feeling of not being able to get a clear picture of how Charles felt. He talks a lot about psychology. <clears throat> the actual wedding itself went off without a hitch. It was the most wonderful day of my life. Charles was perfect. Dr. and Mrs. Shepard were perfect. Mary Faye and Norris were perfect. Mama and Daddy were perfect. Mama wore a long dress, pink, and she was real pretty, except her hairdo was a little tight. Daddy looked the way he does at church, out of place in a suit, and his head white where his hat goes and his face red. He looks like he has high blood pressure, but it's normal and always has been. Right before we walked down the aisle, he said, Honey, I'm real happy for you. Charles is a good man. His chin was quivering and two tears rolled down his cheeks. He was holding my hand, which is something I don't remember him doing ever since I was a little girl. Daddy don't show much emotion. A bunch of people said it was the nicest wedding they had ever been to. I was just flushed throughout the whole thing. It went exactly according to plans. Charles was handsomer than I've ever seen him. The shoulders in his tux were padded. The wedding was fairly short, and we all went straight to the reception in the education building without getting our pictures made so people wouldn't have to wait. Mama was real worried about us not getting a photographer, but Mac Lumley did it for only $10 over cost. Mama and Mrs. Shepard, Millie, cried several times each, and so did Flora and Aunt Naomi and Aunt Flossie, and two or three times Dr. Shepard gave Millie a long hug right there in front of everybody. Charles's friend, Buddy Speller, spent some time talking to Mary Faye and Norris. I thought that was nice. Buddy and my cousins fixed up our car with tin cans and shaving cream. We changed clothes. Sylvia Curtis caught the bouquet, and we ran to Charles's Dodge Dart under all that rice and headed for Myrtle Beach. Now, the honeymoon. I do not have the nerve to explain everything that happened on the first night there in the Holiday Inn. We had talked about it some before, or Charles had talked about it. And we had, you know, necked the same as any engaged couple. And I had told Charles way back, of course, that I wanted my marriage consumed after I was married. Not before. Because if it was consumed before, then I would have to carry the thought of that throughout my entire life. And it's hard to undo that which has already been done. I've read books. I've had talks with my mama. And I've read the Bible. You'd think that would prepare a woman for her wedding night. It didn't. First of all, Charles had ribeye steaks rolled into our room on this metal table with drawers which could keep the steaks warm. And there in the middle of the table was a dozen red roses. And all that was nice. But in this silver bucket with ice and a white towel was, of all things, a bottle of champagne. It was a predicament for me. Because on the one hand, it was all so wonderful, and Charles had planned it all, like, all out like the man is supposed to do. I mean, my dream was being fulfilled. Charles was getting things right. But on the other hand, there in the middle of the table, rearing its ugly head, as they say, was a bottle of champagne. Now, I've seen enough bottles of champagne after the World Series on TV, 
when the ball players make fools of themselves and cuss over the airways to no one when I see one. Well, I'm not a prude. Getting drunk at your wedding is one thing, but maybe, but I can understand a little private celebrating, maybe, as a symbol of something wonderful happening, something symbolic. So I didn't say anything about the champagne. It's very hard to find fault on your wedding night with a dozen red roses staring you full in the face, even though a still small voice was warning me. Charles poured me a glass and I said to myself, why not just a sip, like medicine, and I try to sip, but that's all. It tasted like Alka-Seltzer with honey in it. I politely refused any more, and I didn't think Charles would drink over a glass. I figured maybe you couldn't buy it except in the bottle, and that's why he got it that way. We finished eating, and Charles pushed the table with the dishes out into the hall. I said, excuse me, went into the bathroom, put on my negligee, and got ready, you know, and came back out to find Charles standing there in his Fruit of the Looms, drinking champagne out of a plastic cup. It was a terrible scene to remember. I was planning to do what Mama explained to me, get in bed and let Charles carry out his duties. And I was thinking that's what Charles was planning to do, but he had a different idea, which I do not have the nerve to explain. It turned into an argument which finally turned into a sort of Chinese wrestling match with my nerves tore all to pieces. Charles kept saying, nothing in the Bible about what married people could or couldn't do. I finally cried and Charles said he was sorry. It was awful. I cried again the next morning and Charles said he was sorry again. This may be something I can forgive, but I don't think I'll ever forget it, not for a long time. One more, one more short scene, if you can stand it. This is after they've been married a while. Charles is in the bedroom, covered up in the bed. There are 11 broken monogrammed glasses here on the kitchen floor, and every window in the house is locked from the inside. This all started last Saturday afternoon when I called Mama as usual. I try to call her every day. We've always been close, and I say those television commercials about calling somebody, reaching out and touching, make sense. Belinda Osborne drives to see her mother every day, 40 miles round trip, which I'm not about to do. That is too close. Three times a week is often enough, though Belinda's mother is sick a lot. I'd like to be living closer to home, and I know Mama and Daddy were disappointed we didn't move into the Wilkins house, and I would have, but Charles insisted we live here in Lister because it's close to the college. I finally said okay when he promised he would still go to church with me at home in Bethel. But he's been going to church less and less, and we've only been married six weeks. He'll take me to Sunday school and drop me off, still wearing his pajamas under his clothes. He's done it twice. Deacon Brooks said since Charles was a Methodist, he must think he's too good for free will Baptists. He pretended he was kidding, but I could tell he was serious. Well, as I said, I called Mama last Saturday afternoon, and she told me that she had come by with Aunt Naomi and Aunt Flossie to see us that morning, but we were gone. They came on in to use the phone to call Annie Godwin so it wouldn't be long distance. We don't lock the door normally. Aunt Naomi went to the kitchen to get a glass of water and accidentally broke one of the monogram glasses Cousin Emma had given us for a wedding present. Mama told me all this on the phone. I didn't think twice about it. I figured I'd just pick up another glass next time I'm at the mall. I know where they come from. Sunday, the very next day, we're eating dinner at home in Bethel with Mama, Daddy, Uncle Nate, Mary Faye, and Norris. Mama always fixes at least two meats, five or six vegetables, two kinds of cornbread, biscuits, chow chow, pickles, pies, and sometimes a cake. Mama says, where did you tell me you all were yesterday morning? She was getting the cornbread off the stove. She's always the last to sit down. At the mall, I said. I like where you moved the couch to, says Mama. It looks better. We waited for you all 15 or 20 minutes. I'm sorry Naomi broke the glass, she said. I hadn't mentioned it to Charles. No reason to, he says, and he was serious. Why were you all in our house? I was mortified in my heart. We were just using the phone, says Mama. There was a long silence. It built up, and it kept going. Pass the turnips, Mary Fay, I said. I couldn't figure out what was wrong in there, so I moved things around until it looked better, and sure enough, it was the couch. The couch was wrong. 
My mama ain't nosy, no more than any decent woman would be about her own flesh and blood. Listen, I don't have anything to hide, and Lord knows Charles don't, except maybe some of his opinions. We finished eating and sat in the den and talked for a while, and the subject didn't come up again. Charles always gets fidgety within 30 minutes of when we finish eating. He has no appreciation for just sitting and talking. And I don't mean going on and on about politics or something like that. I mean just talking, talking about normal things. So since he gets fidgety, we usually cut our Sunday visits short. Well, I guess we'd better get on back, I say, while Charles sits over there looking like he's bored to death. I know Mama notices. Before we're out of the driveway, Charles says, Rainy, I think you ought to tell your mama and Aunt Naomi and Aunt Flossie to stay out of our house unless somebody's home. To stay out of my own house. He couldn't even wait until we were out of the driveway and all the car windows were rolled down. When we got out on the road, out of hearing distance, I said, Charles, you don't love mama and you never did. He pulls the car over beside the peaches for sale sign across from Parker's Pond and just stares at me. The whole thing has tore me up. Charles, I said, and I had to start crying, you don't have to hide your life from Mama and them, or me. You didn't have to get all upset today. You could understand if you wanted to. You didn't have to get upset either when I opened that oil bill addressed to you. There ain't going to be nothing in there but an oil bill, for heaven's sakes. Why would anyone want to hide an oil bill? I cannot understand. He starts hollering at me. The first time in my life anybody has sat in a car and hollered at me. His blood vessels stood all out. I couldn't control myself. It was awful. If you've ever been hollered at while you are crying by the one person you love best in the world, you know what I mean. This was a part of Charles I had never seen. Here's what happened yesterday. We went to Penny's Grill for lunch. I refuse to cook three meals a day. I don't care what Mama says. When we got back, there was Mama's green Ford parked in front of the house. Is that your mother's car, says Charles? Where? There. Oh, in front of the house. I think it might be. That long silence from the dinner table last Sunday came back, and I hoped Mama was out in the backyard picking up apples because I knew I couldn't stand another scene within a week. I couldn't think of a thing to say. I didn't want to fuss at Charles right before he talked to Mama, and I certainly wouldn't dare fuss at Mama. Charles got out of the car, not saying a word, and started for the house. I was about three feet behind, trying to keep up. The front door was wide open. Charles stopped just inside the door. I looked over at his shoulder, and there was Mama coming through the arched hall doorway. She stopped. She was dressed for shopping. Well, where in the world have you all been, she says. We've been to eat, I said. Eating out? Mrs. Bell said, Charles, please do not come in this house when we're not here. I could not believe what I was hearing. It was like a dream. Mama says, Charles, son, I was only leaving my own daughter a note saying to meet me at the mall at 2 o'clock at the fountain. The front door was open. You should lock the front door if you want to keep people out. Mrs. Bell, a person is entitled to his privacy. I'm entitled to my own privacy. This is my, our house. I, this is my daughter's house, son. My mama was never refused entrance to my house. She was always welcome every day of her life. I was afraid Mama was going to cry. I opened my mouth, but nothing came out. Mrs. Bell says, Charles, it seems as though you think everything you think is right is right for everybody. Charles, I said, that's what everybody thinks, in a sense. That's even what you think. Charles turned half around so he could see me. He looked at me, then he looked at Mama. Mama says, son, I'll be happy to buy you a new monogram glass if that's what you're so upset about. Naomi didn't mean to break that glass. I'm going over to the mall right now, and I know where they come from. Charles walks past me and out the front door, stops, turns around, and says, I didn't want any of those damned monogram glasses in the first place, and I did the best I could to make that clear, plus that's not the subject. I did give him a monogram blue blazer for his birthday, and he cut the initials off before he'd wear it. So now Mama's at the mall with her feelings hurt. Charles is in the bedroom with a blanket over his head, and I'm sitting here amongst 11 broken monogram glasses and every door and window locked from the inside. 
Evidently, Charles throws things when he's very mad. I never expected violence from Charles Shepard. Thank God we don't have a child to see such behavior. It goes on. Can this marriage be saved? <laughs> yeah, it is a fun book. 